Hi friends, welcome to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. I am Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book, Focused Neurology. Today, we will be talking about nerve conduction studies which is a very important part of the investigation of the nervous system. So with nervous, with nerve conduction studies, we are trying to evaluate the function of nerves. So basically nerve conduction studies, we are trying to find out the sensory nerve conduction studies and motor nerve conduction studies. Sensory nerve conduction studies, basically we are trying to assess the large sensory nerve fibers. So our sensory nerve conduction studies is not going to evaluate the small nerve fibers. So we are going to find out and evaluate the large sensory fibers to the dorsal root ganglia. So you have the sensory pathway coming from the sensory receptors going via the sensory nerves to the dorsal root ganglia. So we are trying to find out the function of these large sensory nerve fibers. And then we have the motor nerve conduction studies where we are trying to evaluate the motor nerves. So the sensory nerve conduction studies as I said it comes from the receptors, sensory nerves and the dorsal root ganglia. So if we try to find out the function of the nerves as it is coming to the dorsal root ganglia you call that as orthodromic studies. So here we we stimulate here and we record here. So this is orthodromic studies. But if we do it the other way, that is we stimulate from proximal and record in the distal parts, we call that as antidromic studies. The advantage of antidromic studies is that the amplitudes will be large because proximally there will be a lot of connective tissue which can impair the amplitudes but when you record it from the distal parts the amplitudes will be large because the connective tissue impairment is less so we are trying to find out by sensory nerve conduction studies the function of the large sensory fibers going to the dorsal root ganglia and we have orthodromic studies and the antidromic studies orthodromic studies and the antidromic studies through antidromic studies the amplitudes are large and we can do the antidromic studies right in the motor nerve conduction studies, we are trying to evaluate the function of the motor fibers coming from the anterior horn cells. So here it comes from the anterior horn cells as a motor nose. Here it goes to the muscle. Here there is a one important concept. In sensory nerve conduction studies, we are trying to evaluate directly and record from the sensory nerves. But in the motor nerve conduction studies when we try to record actually from the motor nerves it is going through the neuromuscular junction and the muscle and then we are recording it and therefore there is some amount of delay when it travels through the neuromuscular junction and the muscle so to combat that we can have two two stimulating electrodes and then record the pathway between the two stimulating electrodes and therefore we know the conduction velocity by which we can, we can subtract or we can circumvent the problem of the neuromuscular junction and the, and the delay in the muscle propagation. So here in motor nerve conduction studies, since there is a delay in neuromuscular junction and muscle propagation, we use two electrodes for stimulating and then recording it. Right. Now coming to the pathophysiology of the nerve conduction studies, basically we are trying to evaluate and find out whether there is axonal involvement or the myelin sheath involvement because with demyelinative disorders like guillain barre syndrome or chronic inflammatory demyelinative polyneuropathy, the prognosis is better but with axonal neuropathies, the prognosis is worse. So the one of the important purposes of the nerve conduction studies is to find out whether it is an axonal loss or a demyelinative loss. So to understand that we need to know the pathophysiology. 
So basically we have the axon here in the center and the covering of it we call it as the myelin sheath. And we have nodes of Ranier. So as long as the myelin sheath is intact and the nodes of Ranier are intact, the impulse jumps from one node of Ranier to the other node of Ranier. From one node of Ranier to the other node of Ranier, what you call that as saltatory conduction. Because the impulse travels at a very good speed because of the saltatory conduction, the myelinated nerves have good conduction velocity. But the moment the myelin sheath gets affected, the saltatory conduction gets impaired and therefore there is slowing of the conduction velocity. Very important point. Therefore, in demyelinating neuropathies, there is predominantly slowing of conduction velocity because the myelin sheath is affected. The saltatory conduction, the impulse jumping from one node of Ranvier to the other node of Ranvier is affected and therefore there is slowing of conduction. But if you take axon, axon and neuropathy, when the axon is affected, there will be reduced amplitude. So if there is an axonal loss or axonal neuropathy, there is reduced amplitude. Whereas in demyelinating lesions, there is reduced conduction velocity. So when it is an axonal neuropathy, there is reduced amplitude. So if it is in the sensory nerve conduction studies, the amplitude is reduced. We call that as snap sensory nerve action potential. If the amplitudes are reduced when we are doing motor nerve conduction studies, we call that as CMAP, compound motor action potential. So in axonal neuropathies, there is a decrease in the amplitude, whereas in myelin demyelinated lesions, there is a reduced conduction velocities. So it could be sensory nerve conduction velocity or motor nerve conduction velocity. Again, there is another important concept here. When the myelin sheath is uniformly affected, like hereditary neuropathies, like example charcot Marie tooth disease, the conduction velocity is equally impaired in all the nerves. Because all the nerves, the myelin sheath is equally impaired. There is a uniform loss of myelin in hereditary neuropathies. And therefore, there is a generalized decrease in conduction velocity Example, hereditary neuropathy, charcot Marie tooth disease. But if it is an acquired demyelinative neuropathy like goulain barre syndrome, there may not be uniform loss of myelin and therefore, and therefore the conduction velocity also will not be uniformly decreased. Example, goulain barre syndrome in acquired neuropathies. So in a, in a hereditary neuropathy, there is a generalized uniform loss of myelin so conduction velocity is equally decreased in all nerves, whereas in acquired neuropathies it may be patchy and therefore the conduction velocity also may be decreased more in some nerves and less in the other nerves. And second important point is that there could be a focal loss of myelin, what you call that as conduction block. Classic example is carpal tunnel syndrome, where the median nerve gets, gets squeezed between the carpal bones or the ulnar nerve at the elbow. So you call that as conduction block. So when the compression is so severe that not only the myelin but also the axons also may get affected. In fact, there can be a drop of 40% amplitude, the reduction in the amplitude. So when you, when you compare the proximal amplitude above the block as to the distal area, the amplitude below the block, there could be a 40% reduction in the amplitude. Of course, the focal decrease in conduction velocity, then you call that as focal loss of myelin, otherwise known as conduction block. Example, carpal tunnel syndrome, where there is a prolongation of distal motor latency, a slowing of conduction velocity, and there could be a, a drop of 40% or a reduction of the amplitude above the block as compared to below the block. So this is another important concept. And the third important point regarding demyelinative neuropathies is temporal dispersion. What is this temporal dispersion? If you take now, there are a lot of nerve fascicles. So a large myelinated nerve fascicle can, can, can conduct a velocity at a great speed and then below that it is slightly affected, so the velocity will be slightly decreased. 
and we know that again the nerve is more affected and therefore the velocity may be more decreased. So there is a differential degree of slowing within the various fascicles of the affected nerve. Because of the differential slowing of the differential degree of slowing within the various fascicles of the affected nerve, you can see this serrated appearance. So this conducts at a great speed and then slightly less speed and slightly less speed and then it comes like this. So this serrated appearance of this of this waveform is called as temporal dispersion. Again, a classic finding of a demyelinated disorders. So these are all the few important differences of axonal loss as compared to the demyelination. Very important because our basic approach is to find out in nerve conduction studies whether, whether it is axonal loss or demyelinated. Because axonal loss has got a poor prognosis as compared to the demyelinated lesions. So summarizing the nerve conduction changes of the axonal loss and demyelination. So first we see axonal loss. What will happen to the amplitude, conduction velocity and distal latency. If it is an axonal loss, as I said, the amplitude gets very much decreased. So in axonal loss, the amplitude gets very much decreased. But since the myelin sheath is intact, the conduction velocity is preserved and the distal latency is preserved. So in axonal loss, only the amplitude is decreased, but the conduction velocity is preserved and the distal latency is preserved. But if we take a demyelinative lesion, the amplitudes are preserved with uniform demyelination. So with a uniform demyelination like generalized hereditary neuropathy, generalized disease like hereditary neuropathy, the amplitudes are usually preserved. But as I said in this, con in this uh, conduction blocks, when the block is so much severe that it can even affect the axons and the amplitudes may be decreased. And therefore in a conduction block, the amplitudes may be decreased with conduction block. So in demyelinated disease, generally the amplitudes are preserved with the uniform demyelination. But if there is a conduction block, the amplitudes may be decreased. And because of the solitary conduction being affected, what happens? There is a slowing of the conduction velocity and there is a prolongation of the distal latency. So these are the fundamental differences between the axonal loss and demyelinative lesions. In axonal loss, amplitude is decreased, whereas in demyelinative lesions, the conduction velocity is slowed. Right. Another important concept when we compare, when we come to the sensory nerve conduction studies, is to differentiate between the pre-ganglionic lesion and post-ganglionic lesions. As I said in the early part of my lecture, the sensations come from the sensory receptors ascend in the sensory nerves go to the dorsal root ganglia and then the spinal cord. The dorsal root ganglia is, is bit away from the spinal cord. So as long as the dorsal root ganglia is intact, like a pre-ganglionic lesion, the sensory nerve conduction studies will be normal. A person may have a sensory loss, but if the lesion is proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, sensory nerve conduction studies will be normal, very important point. But if the lesion is distal to the dorsal root ganglia, the sensory nerve conduction studies will be affected, will be abnormal. So a very important differentiating point between a pre-ganglionic lesion and a post-ganglionic lesion is that the sensations may be lost in both, but if the sensory nerve conduction studies are performed, if it's a pre-ganglionic lesion that is proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, Sensory nerve conduction studies will be normal, but if the lesion is distal to the dorsal root ganglia, the sensory nerve conduction studies will be affected. So, as I said, we can use an antidromic uh, nerve conduction, sensory nerve conduction studies. We stimulate and then we record. So, as soon as we stimulate, from the point of stimulation, it takes a slight, uh, a slight amount of time in milliseconds for a wave to appear. So the way what we calculate is known as the sensory nerve action potential. And from the stimulus as to the when the wave takes off, you call that as the latency. So you can calculate the conduction velocity by the distance by the time, the time it takes to reach 
for a takeoff and a distance between these two. So if you calculate the distance by time, you get the conduction velocity. So we are primarily interested in the conduction velocity and the amplitude. If the amplitude is decreased, it is an axonal type of neuropathy. If conduction velocity is decreased, it's a demyelinated type of neuropathy. So in pre-ganglionic lesion, sensory nerve conduction studies are normal. In post-ganglionic lesion, sensory nerve conduction studies are abnormal. When we come to the motor nerve conduction studies, as I said in the beginning of my lecture, there is some amount of delay when it travels via the neuromuscular junction and the muscle. So we are not actually directly recording from the motor nerve unlike the sensory nerves. And therefore, what we do is that to, to negate these effects, we stimulate at two sites and then we see the, we calculate the latencies. We calculate the distal motor latency and the proximal latency. We subtract the proximal latency and the distal motor latency. And then we calculate the time for proximal latency and for the distal latency for the wave to take off. So again here, we calculate velocity by distance by time. But here we look at the proximal latency and distal motor latency. We subtract it. Likewise, we, we take the time and subtract it. So distance by time will become the conduction velocity for, for the motor nerve conduction studies. And then again, we look at the CMAP. The compound muscle action potential, right. So these are all about the techniques of the nerve conduction studies and the important concepts in the nerve conduction studies about the axonal loss and demyelination. We have another important concept that late responses. So here once we stimulate with a supramaximal stimulation, after some time a wave may occur at a later point of time which you call it as late response, especially when you do the what are nerve conduction studies? What we call it as F waves. Usually first seen in the foot and therefore they say it is F wave. It is because of the supramaximal stimulation. What happens is that when there is a natural stimulation from the brain to for a, a motor act to be performed, it travels only in one direction from the brain. For example, left cortex to my right hand if I want to lift my right hand. So stimulus is here and the action occurs here. So it, it travels only in one direction because it's a natural stimulation. But when we give an artificial, artificial stimulation to assess the motor nerve conduction studies, the impulse travels retrograde as well as the anterior grade. So anterior grade what we record is the M wave, the main wave. But it may go back, go to the anterior cell and then come back. So what happens is that it has gone back to the anterior cell and then has come back again. It has gone to the anterior horn cell and then comes back from the anterior horn cell to the muscle. So it appears slightly later than the main wave. You call that as F wave. So F wave basically occurs, it travels through the anterior root and then coming back. So if you want to assess the ventral root and the radicals and the roots, we can look at the F waves. If there is a prolongation of the F waves, that means the roots are affected. Likewise, when we do the for the sensory nerves when we do it we have another reflex known as H reflex you get it by submaximal stimulation this is an analog or equivalent to the ankle reflex here what happens when we stimulate again it goes and causes the contraction of the soleus muscle but then it comes retrograde and goes to the dorsal root ganglion and again comes back so here this travels to the dorsal root ganglion and then comes back you call that as H reflex. So unlike F wave, what happens here, the course of the tibial H reflex traverses the dorsal root, creating a monosynaptic reflex and subsequent soleus contraction. So this H reflex is equivalent to the ankle reflex. Usually we see in the tibial nerve, not in other nerves. So generally the H reflex, we do it only on this tibial nerve, ankle reflex. So these are the late responses. F wave and H reflex. So this is about the overview of the nerve conduction studies. So basically we have we do it on the motor nerve conduction studies because there are pure, some neuropathies which are purely mute, pure motor neuropathies. There could be some neuropathies which are purely sensory neuropathies. And then in nerve conduction studies we are assessing only the large sensory fibers, not the small sensory fibers. In sensory nerve fibers the important concept is that in preganglionic lesion sensory nerve conduction studies will be normal.
whereas in post ganglionic lesion sensory lesions the sensory nerve conduction gets affected in motor recording because it travels via the neuromuscular junction and muscle we have to use two stimulations and then record in between the two stimulations how the nerve conducts the velocity and then coming to the pathophysiology we have axonal type and demyelinated type axonal loss mainly the amplitudes are decreased whereas in a demyelinated type if it is generalized there will be conduction velocity slowing and the distal latency go long but amplitudes are normal but if there is a conduction block the axons also can get affected and the amplitude may be decreased if there may not to be conduction block in demyelinated neuropathy generally the amplitudes are preserved i hope you have got an uh, overview you have got an, an understanding a general understanding of the nerve conduction studies i really enjoyed giving this lecture if you have any suggestions to make you can post it in my youtube channel my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts you can like and subscribe to my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts and my fb page dr srinivas concepts thank you bye